Uh, happy to be here with you. I'm going to start off and show you a video uh, with the uh, uh, famous Dave Snowden. Anybody heard of Dave Snowden before? Yeah, great. I, I had the pleasure to meet him with him in, in Slovenia at, at a conference and uh, he's really smart. So, um, I'll be showing this video first. Let's imagine if you can that you've got to organise a party for a bunch of 11-year-old boys and you want to apply the three different types of systems that apply in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random, you might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. <laughs> they get burned down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place. Um, I have friends in California who have tried this, I don't recommend it, um, the recovery cost is fine, but it's a legitimate approach. <laughs> On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the order systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. The learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds, and place those around the room where you're going to hold a party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcomes. Once you've done that, the you know, senior adult can start the party with a motivational video play. <laughs> After all, you don't want the children wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objectives of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. And of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here, we draw a line in the sand known as a boundary in complexity theory and we turn to the children and say, cross that with the poor bastards and you die. acceptable <laughs> negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes, and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it. If it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. Mm -hmm. So complexity theory, uh, what what um, uh, Management 3.0 is about. <clears throat> it's based on the thoughts... A lot of management books are full of great stories. You read things like Empowering Workers or Delighting Customers. Oh, this is cool. Great suggestions, <laughs> but they're not actionable, are they? It's what you want to know is how to change your organization starting right now. The Management 3.0 workshops are about collaboration, team play, and creating smart ideas together. They're about storytelling, using real stories, examples, and reflection. About meeting others with the same questions. About creativity, teamwork, useful handouts, and walls full of hands-on tips. But most importantly, Management 3.0 workshops are a great experience, and they are fun. Are you ready to make a difference while having a great time? Learn more about Management 3.0 right here, right now. That was not planned, but a little bit of promotion around Management 3.0. Uh, how many know here what is uh, Management 3.0? Wow, one person. Fantastic. Well, we haven't really conquered UK yet, <laughs> is my um, thought here. Uh, and that's great, there are not many UK facilitators actually in Management 3.0, which is a shame because it's a great management framework. And we have facilitators all over the world, uh, around 130 nowadays. And they are spread 
from China to Brazil, the Nordics, Sweden, I come from Sweden, and uh, a lot in uh, Germany, actually, it's the biggest country for facilitators. So today I will briefly talk about Management 3.0, uh, just for you to be a little bit inspired to know more, because I will spend most of the time today to play one of the many games from Management 3.0. Uh, it's a framework, a leadership framework, and it's made up of principles. It's based on the agile principles and of complexity theory. And we use a lot of practical tools and games when we, um, when we teach management trio. So we will play a game called delegation poker together. And I have uh, cards for everybody and some delegation poker stories that I will hand out and uh, then we'll play together in, in groups of four or five. Okay, so this is my company, it's Green Bullet Solutions. Uh, I'm from Sweden, as I said, uh, I'm a consultant. Um, I'm also the founder of a conference called Agile People Sweden. And I will talk a bit uh, more about that conference a little bit later. It's all in English and um, yeah, we we'll talk about that. Uh, I am a hybrid between IT, HR, and management, you could say. So uh, uh, my training is in finance, but I worked mostly as an IT product manager and uh, in HR related projects, IT for HR. So then I came over on the other side, so to speak, and, and worked more with HR and management. Uh, so now for 20 years, I've been working with that. And I'm a Management 3.0 facilitator, of course. So what is Management 3.0? Well, a guy uh, from the Netherlands, his name is Jürgen Appelow, who invented this framework. And he wrote three incredible books. Uh, the first one is this, from 2011. That's the kind of basic Management 3.0 book. Uh, and then we have another small little booklet called How to Change the World that he wrote. Uh, not so long after that. And the last one is a masterpiece, Management for your Workout, Games, Tools and Practices to Engage People, Improve Work and Delight Clients. That one I can recommend extremely much. You should read it. It's fantastic, it's beautiful, it's colored pictures, a lot of pictures inside, lots of tips and tricks. So don't miss out on, on that book. Uh, so why do we call it Management 3.0? What do you think? Anybody wants to give it a try? Yeah? Um, well, there's, there's a couple of movements like Marketing 3.0, there's Motivation 3.0, so it's kind of getting that thing. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, if, if we, if we um, talk about Management 1.0, what do you think that is? It's the hierarchical, top-down, pyramids, with control, uh, kind of management style. Uh, micromanagement. That's uh, one that of Taylorism at its worst. And management 2.0, then, is when all these different consultant methods came with Six Sigma, you know, a business process re-engineering, <coughs> balance scorecard, they try to kind of put the plaster on a, a piece of the system, but they didn't see the whole system. Uh, and they missed the point, which is that it's about uh, people and relationships, and not about processes or tools or anything else. So people and relationships, of course, in the center, uh, based on complexity, uh, complexity theory and the agile, I'm sure you uh, have seen this before, the benefits obtained from Agile, including ability to manage change, increased productivity, uh, improved project visibility, of course, uh, team morale and so on, increases when we work with Agile. But there are still problems here, and uh, most of them are actually management related. I'm sure you can agree. Uh, about that. We don't have a problem in the team, but we have a problem with management, especially top management. 
And we have a few of those problems here that managers could help to solve uh, if they wanted to. And that's the ability to change organizational culture. That's the biggest one. Uh, resistance, general resistance to change. Uh, trying to fit agile into a non-agile framework or environment. Uh, so there is a lot management can do about uh, facilitating implementing agile. So uh, as I said, it's about human beings and um, it's uh, to, to make the prerequisites for making people perform together. Um, because you can't really motivate people like that. You, you can try and motivate, but you can only get uh, people to motivate themselves, intrinsic motivation. And here Peter Drucker, he says that, yeah, management is, is still extremely important. Uh, it's the critical determining factor in our organizations that we have management. But it doesn't necessarily have to be tied uh, to a formal management role. We can talk about self-management. Uh, for example, we can talk about autonomy. We can talk about <coughs> informal management that appears in an organization. Uh, so we're not talking about formal appointed managers as such. So that's not what, what Peter Drucker is talking about here. Not, it, it's more the informal kind of management and self-management. Because everybody is a manager. Management is too important to be left to the managers, said Jürgen Appelow, one of his famous quotes. And then we have six views, um, organizational views, in this figure that I like to... <coughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of tree-like figure floating around, and it's got these big eyes because uh, it's called Marty. And you may be familiar with a guy called Monty Feldman, who was a comedian in the 60s. He's got those big, big eyes. Anyway, Monty has um, six arms, uh, and these are the six uh, areas where you, as a manager or as an employee uh, who is self-managed, need to work all the time. And the first one is energize people. Uh, to create prerequisites for engagement and uh, motivation. The second one is empower teams. Now, empowerment uh, supposes that you have a manager, right? So, uh, but, but many times you have managers in organizations. It's just these uh, managerless organizations like Morningstar and Gore and similar organizations. There, there are not many of them. So we still need empowerment, uh, unfortunately, in, in our organizations. Um, and it's to align the constraints. That's about clear purpose, clear goals, setting the boundaries within which I'm free to act. We also have developed competence, of course. And as consultants, competence is the most important thing that there is. Um, it's what what's in people's he heads and for you yourselves as developers as well. Uh, we need to grow the structure in the company when it grows. We need to grow structure in a way that enhances uh, communication. And we need to continuously improve everything. Continuously improve. So these are the six things you need to work with all of the time in organizations. We're going to start to look a little bit uh, on the first one, energize people. And <clears throat> as you probably all know by now, uh, extrinsic motivation doesn't work. It creates a lot of uh, behaviors that we don't want in organization. It creates sub-optimizations. It, it, it creates um, behaviors that are not really constructive and beneficial for, for us to be able to reach our common goal. You run towards the goal until you get your bonus and then you stop, for example. Uh, so, carrots and sticks don't work. There's a great book called like that, by the way. Um, so, what else? What is that? Intrinsic motivation. This is what we need. 
uh, and that's where the goal is its own reward. Uh, you can, ex for example, um, when a team reaches their goals and they make a really uh, high quality product, that's the reward that they get in itself. So, so the goal is, is uh, its own reward. And there's an, another great guide, <coughs> Symptomatic for Management 3.0, that <coughs> Jorgen Upload picks a lot of theories from everywhere, and then he makes his own uh, kind of uh, thoughts around that. And this is from Stephen Rice, Who Am I? He, um, he is a researcher, American researcher, who has um, uh, identified si 16 <coughs> basic behaviors that all people have. All people have them to some degree, but the degree is different. And when you measure only 16 uh, behaviors, uh, you get a fingerprint for a person. Because all the different profiles are unique. Everybody has a unique profile. Nobody has the same uh, needs, basic needs level of these 16 needs. So, Jürgen Appelou said, okay, let's remove the ones that we don't get satisfied in the workplace. That's his take on these 16 basic desires. So, now we have a fewer, a fewer needs. And then he said, okay, he read the book of self-determined termination research, uh, Edward Desi. Uh, and there are three more here, competence, autonomy, and relatedness. So you put them in as well, uh, and added competence to the whole enchilada. And then we got uh, 10 intrinsic desires. And then he took uh, Dan Pink's book, Drive, and he derived three more. And they pretty much go into the previous ones here. Idealism, purpose, around the same thing, independence and autonomy, and competence, mastery. So we have uh, 10 intrinsic desires as a conclusion. And these are curiosity, uh, the need to think. So this is highly different depending on who you are. What is your need for curiosity? Your need to think and figure out things. Uh, it could be very low or it could be very high. <coughs> Honor. It's about sharing values with a group. For example, take the Marines. They would die for their peers, for example. Uh, that's a very strong need that some people have. But others, not so much. Except that certain people have an extremely high need to being accepted as they are. And mastery. Uh, many people have a high need for mastering, knowing that they have the competence that is necessary for them to be able to perform their, their job in a good way. Uh, power. It's also a need that some people have. Um, and the need to influence other people. Freedom. We talk a lot about teamwork in Agile, but actually we also have a need for individuality and freedom. Relatedness is the need for social contact, that we also have more or less of. Order and stability and structure. Some people are extremely high on order and others are low. So you can see how can these people work together. It becomes a bit difficult. So if you're aware of the differences, it's much easier. Uh, to have a need for purpose or a need for goal and, and being able to combine that personal goal with your work. A uh, need for status, to have an award because you are doing well or to, to have the parking space closest to the reception as uh, in one company that I worked for, uh, the CEO always had that greatest parking space. And that was a status thing for him. And, and all these uh, different needs is a game also in Management Trio. You can play it, uh, you can play it out like, uh, here is my greatest need, here is my uh, smallest need, and so on. Uh, and, and then you can discuss with each other, 
with a manager, with a peer, in the team, or in a recruitment situation, it's perfect to use these cards. But we're not going to do that today, because I wrote in the description that we were going to play delegation poker, so it will be delegation poker. Um, other ways to get to know each other, except for moving motivators, because it's about getting to know it each other in organizations to work better together. It's uh, 360 degree elevation. Um, could be a good, in, in, it's basically a good method, but when you um, ha, um, use a system where you can be anonymous uh, behind it, it's maybe not so good for the trust in the organization. Happiness index. And here we see the trends in happiness in people. If you ask them, instead of every year or every second year, as, uh, as was my experience uh, yeah, with the Swedish police, they actually ask their employees every second year how they are. And I mean, it's a fresh thing. It, happiness or uh, well-being or engagement is not something that you can measure every second year. You have to measure it all the time. And when you see the team trend dropping, then you can take up a discussion. Hello guys, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And then you get this trend instead. Happiness index. Of course, social networks, it's a given. Important to remember is uh, this behavior is a function of the individual's personality and the environment. So the personality is one thing, but then you put the person in a situation where the person interacts with a lot of other people. And this is uh, extremely important, because a person can be totally different in one situation or in another one. So if you compare these two, you can think it's a different person, but it's really a function of personality and environment. So about empowerment, um, if we go to the second arm here, uh, the system here is the brain. So the brain is more complex than we uh, might believe. You can't really control everything from one point. Uh, and you need to distribute uh, the power to the different parts of the brain. And. Um, this is a definition of empowerment. It's implementing distributive control by delegating authority. And this is the one thing that hierarchies are, are good at. It's to make sure that everybody has one boss, only one. If we go to align constraints, now we're just touching very briefly each of the arms of Marty here because we won't have time for more. Uh, Align constraints is about purpose, common goals, and about uh, setting the boundaries if you wish, for, for the organization. So we need a common rule. You can't let some stakeholders own goal take over. Uh, I went yesterday to a Lego session, uh, and this is a great way of visualizing uh, the goal together with a group of people, because when you do build with Lego, you release and open up uh, your brain. And then, of course, you need to, to also communicate your goals. Otherwise, uh, this can happen. As I'm sure you also recognize how you say one thing, but it's interpreted in the, in the other person's brain as something else. And something else comes out, of course. That's when we need visualization, prototyping, uh, metaphors, storytelling, and all these agile tools that you use on a daily basis. Because code, you can't really see what, what, what it's doing just by looking at the code. At least I can't. <laughs> uh, develop competence. And there are three maturity levels, you could say. Um, Shuhari, they say in, in Japan. Uh, the Shu is the apprentice, the junior uh, person, the Ha is the journeyman, a uh, little bit more competent, more experienced, and Ri is the master, uh, who is, uh, yeah, 
higher standing creature in a way. Uh, and what they say is that the master cannot really teach the apprentice. It takes a journeyman to teach the apprentice. And it takes a master to teach the journeyman because it's too far apart between the master and the apprentice. And uh, something else about competence, it's really a function of discipline and skill. If you just have skill and no discipline, you don't have competence. If you just have discipline and no skill, you don't have competence either. So you need both. And there are many, many ways, of course, to develop, develop competence. Here are a few. And the by far most important one here is the first, self-development. Because if people don't want to develop themselves, you will not develop them. And you, you can't really develop people, right? They can only develop themselves. So we should stop pretending that we can develop people. Um, girl structure. There's something, uh, how many have heard about T-shaped people? Yeah, some of you, great. So you know what it is. Higher generalizing specialists or uh, specializing generalists. You are very good at something. You have a very narrow understanding of, uh, or how should I put it, a deep understanding of one thing, and then you have a broad general understanding of many different things. If you have a lot of T-shaped people in your organization, you can create teams that are extremely flexible and will not be dependent on experts. Uh, promoting formal leadership, the Twitter icon is of course uh, uh, because you follow who you want on Twitter. You can't force anybody to follow somebody. Uh, and this is better because the leadership should then um, kind of emerge from the team. They could be informal managers for a short or longer time and then they disappear and somebody else picks up the stick and take the leadership role. You should also work with more wide job titles. Uh, you should not try to, to close in people into job boxes by having very long roles uh, or titles on people, because then you narrow people's uh, ability to grow and develop. Um, so you should use the job title as a box on standing on, instead of closing people inside. And these three um, things tend to reinforce each other. When you work with all three, you get good organizations. Every team should be a value unit that del deliver value to another unit. And then the last one is improve everything all of the time. And uh, this is very nicely uh, written about in uh, this book, How to Change the World. It's about change management on a system level, individual level, um, environment level and relationship level. So we're back to empower teams, and we are going to play delegation poker because I see you're getting tired now. Um, okay, you know all this. Teams can self-organize. It requires empowerment, authorization, and trust. And software development, agile software development works because of self-organizing teams. Um, I like this picture a lot. Um, we need to keep the balance here. We have extreme order, a lot of processes, structure, a lot of reports, a lot of manuals, a lot of micromanagement. You don't need to think. Okay, we compare that with a traffic light in, in a crossing where you drive a drive car, a crossing, you come to a crossing, there's a traffic light, right? The traffic goes red, you stop. So you just react or to something. Uh, instead, in complexity, we have, it's like a roundabout. You have to be competent to drive in a roundabout. It's not very easy. I think I spent three driving lessons trying to learn how to drive in a roundabout. Um, my, my driving teacher was very happy. Uh, anyway, when I, when I learned to do it, I could do it. I was competent, okay? And you also need to, to take them into account and respect your fellow drivers, right? The other cars. 
you have to, okay, there's somebody else, maybe I should write carefully here. Uh, so it works much better when you can do it, right, than the traffic light. Uh, so this is the difference between, uh, in a way, agility then, and the traditional kind of management. Chaos, we all know that. Web agencies, everything is happening all of the time. There is no structure at all. Uh, it's ad hoc at its worst. So we need a little bit of structure, but just enough. And it's about creating that balance that management three always about. Another method for this is nice. It's like um, this one. Managers are like gardeners. Um, you know, a garden that nobody takes care of, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Not so nice, right? So, also, if you put a seed into the soil and you do everything and it still doesn't grow. I mean, you, you, you're a gardener, you're a manager, let's say. You take away the weed, you give good um, soil, uh, you put some fertilizer, you give it water, good sunshine and so on. You do everything right and still it doesn't grow. What could be the problem? I mean, the seed may be sick or maybe has problem in his marriage or her marriage or maybe something else. You don't know. That's the point. Uh, maybe it wasn't supposed to be there in that soil. Maybe it was supposed to be on the other side of the world, but there it could grow really well. Then you should should not try that kind of seed in that kind of soil. Um, key decision areas. This is part of now the preparation for the games you need to listen up. Um, we have key decision areas in organizations, right? Um, and we should know what we are responsible for to not walk into invisible fences. Uh, and that means that you know exactly what you can decide and what you, what you cannot decide. And on the other axis we have um, on what level can I decide? This is a race hit matrix, uh, which is an old way of showing this. I'm going to show you another uh, level way of uh, showing the levels. This is this one, seven levels of authority. The first one is I, as a manager, tell the people the decision. I don't ask them, I don't try to sell it to them, I just tell them. Number two is to sell the decision convince the team members that this is the right decision. Number three is consult, to get input before I make the decision. Number four is consensus, it's agree. It's the difficult one, I would say. It's time consuming, but when it works, it's uh, obviously a very good one. Number five is that I, as a manager, influence the decision made by the team. Number six it is that um, they ask feedback from me as a manager after they made the decision. So now we go out on the other side, so to speak. And number seven is delegate. I totally delegate this decision to the team. So it could look like this. Number one, relocate to, to another office building. Okay, no, I don't let my team uh, decide about where we are going to relocate at all. But Replace waterfall with scrum, yeah. I try to sell that to my <coughs> team that we are going to work with. And if we take the last one, coding guidelines and pairing. That I really don't want to have anything to do with that decision. But I leave entirely to my team. So these are just examples <coughs> of the different kinds of decision that could be made on, on that level. So uh, the optimal level here for each decision, it depends on, and this is important, people's competence. Do the people have the right competence to make the decision? And the impact or the risk if the team makes the wrong decision. What is the risk? Will we need to, to, to shut down the whole company if they make the wrong decision? Oh, maybe then I shouldn't delegate that decision to the team. 
Or if you think they are competent enough, then go ahead. So we can create authority boards and we can put them up on the wall to make it really, really clear. We have the seven levels of authority on top. We have the key decision areas. What are the different decisions that we want and need to make in the organizations? And then we have teams or people. It could be whole teams, it could be two person. And this is, of course, subject to change. If it doesn't work, go ahead and change it. And the flow should be from left to right. So we want to give more and more and more power to the teams. Because that will free up time for the manager. The manager has maybe other stuff to do than uh, making the decisions that the team could make, right? And uh, these authority boards, in the beginning, they are controlled by the manager, but maybe the control can be uh, delegated to the teams. Delegation is an investment in time for the manager. Uh, maybe it doesn't pay off at first, but it will in a longer perspective. And the ultimate goal then is to remove the managers, all in all. Uh, it's a totally self-directed thing. Usually not attainable because there will always be things happening that we maybe conflicts in the team that they cannot solve themselves. Maybe uh, we need somebody to work with strategic partnerships or tasks that the team don't care about and so on. Okay, so we're playing delegation poker. I'm going to give you each a deck of cards and I will just uh, start to send them, send them out here. Yeah, yeah. 